Hello, I'm Mark O'Connor, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Larissa Bifano, Julia Caraggio, and Vinnie Sanchez, my colleagues from three different jurisdictions from around the world, bringing three different daily perspectives on something that brings us all together, the tech sector itself. Let's dig a little bit deeper to something we've been talking about over the, over the days here. Let's hone in on AI again as yeah, one of the key uh, elements of technology that's driving digital transformation, driving the tech sector. And let's talk a little bit more about uh, the standard to which an AI should be held and the liability piece. Vinny. I think there's an unrealistic expectation. Look about it in the B2B context. What is the expectation as to, like, if I hire you, Mark, to give me a professional opinion on something, you come to the table with all these biases, right? right. And so why do I have a different expectation with AI that it should be unbiased? right? If I'm trying to determine how I'm going to allocate that liability, am I going to sue your parents or your teachers, <laughs> right? Because you come to the table with all these biases, yet I'm, I'm relying on your opinion, right? And I have these AI tools that are expected to be superhuman, almost godlike. So is that really the expectation? So what is the right standard? Is it a software regime standard? Is it a standard based on professional negligence? And what's the responsibility once I, the seller, sell it to another business, right? What is the, where's the liability break? Because it's mm. driven by the data in a, in a large, lot of respects. The data is teaching the algorithms, the tools, the AI. So where does that, where do you draw that line? And whether or not there should be an ongoing obligation to do fine tuning and how that works in terms of the, the sort of the annual audit of the tool to make sure it's actually working the way it should and how it's been influenced by data, right? I think that's going to be the expectation in the market is that there's going to be an ongoing obligation to sort of audit the, the actual AI tools. And the question is, who's going to take on that responsibility? Is it the seller OEM manufacturer of that AI tool? Or is it some other group that's out there providing some sort of third-party independent view? It it's still remains to be seen, but there's actually presents opportunities for the tech sector. Yeah. Does the tech sector not only just sell the AI-driven tool, like a robotic surgical tool, but does it also then provide wraparound services around that to say, look, I'm going to help actually support and maintain that, and I'm actually going to work with you on an annual basis to do an audit. And maybe that becomes the standard of the industry as opposed to this expectation, which is, again, unrealistic, that it has to be perfect and unbiased. And what do we think the standard should be? What's the right analogy? Is it like um, selling technology in the old-fashioned sense with a 90-day or a year and a half warranty, and then that falls away and it's replaced by a service level? Is it the standard uh, in professional services? All of us have to continue with our CLE training to keep ourselves you know, registered and, and, and so forth, keep it to bar rules. Is it like the automotive industry where you take your car in and get it fixed, and if you drive out and it's not working, you go back in and you're cross with them. But then after that, it's kind of down to you, the driver. Where's the right analogy? Do you have a view on this you one? Know, I think it's different from all, from all of those examples because it's co constantly evolving. And it depends on where you are, again, where you are in the, the AI ecosystem. Like, are you buying an end product that uses an algorithm to make some determination and you buy that end product? Or are you buying the algorithm itself then to use on your own data and then inform customers. So I think it depends on where you sit in that in that spectrum of where AI can be used in your business. And then it, AI changes, you know, so if you have certain data that you reply to it, it's going to change, it's going to train, it's going to learn just like people learn, right? So I think to say it's not something that's like, oh, you get a 90 day warranty on it, right? Because the product stays the same. Like if you buy a widget, the widget is the widget now versus 90 days from now, whereas the AI is going to evolve. It'll be old legal principles that are, are tested legal principles that are applied to that technology, but it's not going to be a, a, the same regimes that we are in right now. Also, if I can add uh, that you mentioned the duration of the guarantee. In, uh, with the AI technology, the normal duration, 90 days, or for consumers, two years, might be too long, might be too mm -hmm. short. Mm -hmm. uh, regulations no longer set a specific time, but they just refer to the lifetime of the technology. Uh, and introducing also an obligation to meet the expectations on the consumer of the lifetime, which can evolve over time. Because um, if um, I, I buy an utility now, maybe uh, in the old world, I was expecting to use it uh, for 10 years. 
But uh, with the connected washing machine, maybe I'm not going to buy it because I'm going to have um, the washing machine as a service. And uh, I will expect to have uh, functionalities that uh, will evolve much quicker than in a 10-year uh, time span. It's a great question, Mark, because if you think about the automobiles now, software on wheels, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at what, I think it's gonna be a hybrid, right? You're gonna have the standard sort of, the software needs to work in accordance with some technical mm -hmm. standard, yeah. but that doesn't deal with the actual outcome and results, right? And if you look at most deals that we do today, we all disclaim the, dis the results that are produced by, by software. So I think when you look at the algorithm piece of it, there's probably gonna be this hybrid standard of some sort of, you know, professional standard of workmanlike conduct or mm -hmm. something that talks about um, that the quality of the software, the quality of the algorithm was derived and, and generated or created um, in such a way that was using some um, responsible, ethical AI kind of in standard that's evolving, right? And when then when you look at that, you also have to look at you as the OEM producer of this AI technology, what are your obligations in sort of handing it over to another business? And you might see claims that come out about sort of that knowledge transfer, negligent knowledge transfer, negligent training, right? Did I properly train? Is it too much black box? What's the transparency, right? I need to hand this over in a responsible fashion so that you as the buyer of this technology can actually do something with it. And I think you're gonna to start to see claims that start to look in that space um, and that's where we have to start talking to our clients about how to mitigate that risk. Yeah. What I think what would be interesting too is if it evolves from how you would treat the liability of the sale of a, of a product versus how what accountability we provide to a person and how a person interacts with things. Because as you see, at least on the patent side, there's this big issue as to whether AI can be an inventor. So can AI take on human-like characteristics, at least vis-a-vis -vis the patent office, and, and being able to invent and innovate. South Africa has said that it's an inventor. It's, it's in the courts in the US, and it's not been found to be an inventor in Europe. Is that t a headwind for, or a, a um, sign that maybe the regime would be more like how we assign negligence to people? and how they interact and how actions we have can be formed to be negligent. Is AI gonna take on that standard instead of what a product would have that goes out into the market? That sense that an AI can't be an inventor, can't therefore own the rights. To what extent is that in, in and of itself a protectionist policy? I mean, I think it could be, but I think the real reason why it's an issue right now is because how do you assign ownership? Because again, it's this morphing of technology, uh, something digital into something human. And can you say that AI can own something? Because in the US, for example, inventions are owned by their inventors and then they are assigned to a company. So how does the AI own it? And then how does the AI then assign it to someone else, to a company? But then I think the other main issue is that I don't think that AI has has evolved enough to be actually conceiving inventions. So AI is told is programmed and is told to do certain things and learn certain things, but I think it has not gotten to the point of it actually develops its own inventions. It's just following the instructions that the programmer has provided and processing the data the programmer has provided. I think that will change soon and that it will be an actual inventor. And then we are going to have to grapple with those issues. And I do think there are some judges, and I think, like for example, this one judge in Australia that was going to say that AI was an inventor before it was overturned, mm -hmm. was very into technology. You could read in his opinion, he was super supportive of technology and innovation. So then he wanted, like it was his opinion was AI can be an inventor. But I think you're right if you have judges that think, no, this is people invent. People own inventions, like the um, the copyright issue where a monkey took a picture and does the monkey own the copyright, right? Um, so I think pe it's this view that no, this is what people do. So I think there is there is a piece of that, but then there are, and they, maybe it's hiding behind these legal regimes of oh, well, how do you assign it? Or maybe it didn't actually invent it. And then once we get to a point where we say, you know what, AI did invent something. What are we going to do about it? And we can use contract law to say, you know, if you build an AI system just like we do with employees, they automatically assign it to the company. Then we don't need to worry about that issue. It's automatically assigned, right? And the liability automatically goes to the company. So we can deal with those issues, but you're right. There could be the, that protectionist issue of, you no, know, humans invent things, not machines. You can deal with it in the traditional way, yeah. as you're saying, but, but it's going to change over time. And uh, there's a great phrase in terms of you know, being creeped out. How, cre <laughs> how, how creeped out are you by certain types of AI? So if an AI 
uh, machine works and sifts 10,000 CV applications. So you get 100 to deal with and it's applied some criteria. That's probably okay. I'm probably not too creeped out. Yeah. Um, you know, if an AI decides who amongst a, a whole range of prisoners should be available for parole, yeah, getting a little bit more creeped out, but probably still okay as long as we know it's working okay. If an AI is deciding uh, based on you know, life expectancy of you know, 2% and the electricity usage of the life support machine, all the maths and algorithm would say, well, turn that, turn that life support off. Is that the point where we totally get creeped out and there needs to be a human in the loop to stop that sort of decision? And, and all of us will have a slightly different point on that spectrum as to what we think is right. Yeah, absolutely. It's like the trolley dilemma, right? You, you have a, trial, a runaway trolley yeah. and you have four people on one side and, the, and one person on the other. And the algorithm makes a determination it's better to save four than one, but the one is a pregnant woman. What would you make as a decision? As a human, yeah. right? It's a very difficult decision. Why are we going to feel comfortable back to creeping out, seeding yeah. that to an algorithm? Well, I think this goes also to another point uh, as to whether we need um, to have uh, ethical experts within uh, an organization having uh, a, a, an actual say within the board, for instance. Uh, we heard a lot during the last year and so that uh, there was a, a, a chief of ethics, uh, but uh, then uh, uh, his position was against the policy of the company and uh, sometimes it was, this person was dismissed. Um, is it a question of regulators to give uh, a more prominent role to these individuals uh, or um, kind of um, uh, it becomes a best practice and then whoever follows this rule, uh, then it's going to belong to the good guys league <laughs> and then uh, uh, consumers are going to pick, uh, the business going to pick. Uh, I think uh, with the value of ESG, uh, there's, we're going to have uh, uh, even a, a culture of understanding the ethics uh, of uh, a technology company, even in this field. I think you're right. I think 10, 15 years ago, none of us would be talking about ethics, uh, maybe not even studied ethics. Our children now are studying ethics at school as, as a matter of course, and it's, and it's a, a board level issue. It's uh, coming back to what you were all saying, and it's right there at the heart of, of how technology is deployed going forward. For deeper insights and further commentary from our colleagues in Europe and around the world, we commend to you our Tech Index Report.